Grover's algorithm is an algorithm discovered by Love Grover in 1996. Its original purpose was to solve the unstructured search problem faster than what can be done classically. The purpose of this video is to offer a more beginner-friendly explanation of Grover's algorithm. Once you build up an intuition, the more complex algorithms might make more sense. For this purpose, I will assume some basics of quantum computing, such as knowing a qubit, superposition, tensor products, entanglement, and basic quantum gates, mainly the Hadamard gate. Now let's revisit the problem of unstructured search. Imagine we have a keychain with eight keys and a lock. We are told that only one of the keys opens the lock. Unlike the keys here, where we know before trying that key number two is the right key. Otherwise, all keys are seemingly identical. Neither its shape, color, nor size differs to our eyes. So we have to try the keys one by one to know whether the key does not open the lock or that it does. And when it does, we stop our search. In the general case, the lock is a function that either outputs a 1 or a 0. We can call this function s for search. Trying key number 8, or inputting 8 into the function, will output 0, since it's a wrong key. Only inputting 2, key number 2, will our output be 1, since key 2 opens the lock. Assuming there is only one item we are searching for, like one unique key to a lock, then in the best case, we get lucky on our first try. In the worst case, when we are really, really unlucky, we will try all of the seven wrong keys, and then the last key must be our solution. We then say that in the worst case, the number of candidates we are searching through scales with n, since at most we find n minus one wrong keys. Thus, the upper bound on our computational complexity, as we can call it, is big O of n. Now onto Grover's algorithm. The algorithm can be broken down into three steps. We will be explaining each step in detail in the video. For now, here's an overview. Step one is probability initialization. As the name suggests, it is to initialize our quantum state vector to represent the unstructured search problem. That is, initially, there is an equal probability that any of the keys will be the right key. So our state vector is a superposition of all possibilities with uniform amplitude. This state will be referred to as phi. The second step is a search operator. Our search function in the quantum space can be represented in two ways. First, the functional form. Our search function, Sx, is now an exponent of negative 1, and it continually flips the amplitude of a state if Sx equals 1, since negative 1 to the power of 1 is negative 1. The second way, which we'll be focusing on in today's video, is writing it as a linear operator. And the reason for writing this will be clearer later. For now, this is a reflection operator. And the third step is a reflection of our state vector about the mean amplitude, the diffusion operator, as it is called. This means if a state, one of our ket x's, has an amplitude greater than the mean, it will now be less. And if it was less, it would now be larger than the mean, and we can call this an amplification. We can repeat these two steps around square roots and amount of times before the quantum state is measured, and we will have a high likelihood of observing ket s, the state we desire to measure. In the video, we will develop a strong understanding of Grover's algorithm visually, and arrive at the classical Grover's circle diagram to reason through its computational complexity. As you have noticed, I have claimed these two operators are reflections. But why? Don't worry. We will first begin by talking about reflections. We can first start by thinking about what a reflection is visually. You've probably encountered a reflection without all the math before, reflecting a vector or a point about the x or y axes. For example, for a point with coordinate 3, 4, reflecting across the x-axis means flipping the sign of the component along the y-direction. We flip the 4 to negative 4. 
The question is then, how can we represent flipping with a more basic operation, like subtraction or addition? We see that to reflect, we subtract our state by 4y twice, going from 3, 4 to 3, 0 to 3, negative 4. Then the question is, how might we generalize this operation using a linear operator on our vector? Using the bracket notation, the point is represented as a vector 3, 4. As the standard basic vectors, ket x is 1, 0, and ket y is 0, 1. So our state, let's call it phi, is equal to 3 ket x plus 4 ket y, which gets us 3, 4. We saw that the reflection has the action of subtracting 4y twice from phi. How do we represent this as a product of a matrix with our vector? Looking at the expression, we see that we still have a component of phi. So there has to be an identity matrix in the expression for our operator. We want to end up subtracting 4y twice, but none of the x components. We can obtain the component along the y-axis by applying a projector operator for ket y, bra y. Since x and y are orthogonal to each other, we do not get a component of x projected onto y. So we can write the operator expression as identity minus twice the projector for the y direction. The same can be said for reflection about any non-zero line, since it will have an unchanged orthogonal component. If we can express the line as some matrix u applied on x, and it is orthogonal to u applied on y, then we can describe the reflection across ux since all we did is change our reference basis through u. The question is then, can we generalize this approach to a higher dimension? Our operation above can be described in another manner. Let's try by using the same approach we used for two dimensions. We'd subtract twice the vector's component along the z direction, and then twice the component along the y direction but it's quite tiresome to identify each component to subtract from. Can we think about an equivalent way to describe what is happening? Instead of expressing what has changed, can we express what does not change? The easiest way to see the equivalence relationship is with a light algebra. Remember that the identity matrix is a sum of the projections onto the x, y, and z basis vectors since they form the complete bases in three dimensions. Subtracting two of the y and z projections gets us from one to negative one. If we add a negative projector of x, then we can write that we are subtracting the identity. To ensure equality, we add another projector of x. So the two equations are equal, since projector minus projector equals zero. Finally, we get twice the projector of x minus the identity is also an equivalent way to define a reflection about the x-axis. Here, we have distinguished the two ways to define reflections with a slight nuance in the wording. Now we can get back to Grover's algorithm. Let's go back to step one before we reflect anything, which is to prepare our state vector to represent the initial probability distribution. Understanding how phi is constructed from Hadamard's and represents the mean amplitude helps us understand how it behaves in step three. In this step, we apply the Hadamard gate to each qubit that is initialized to the zero state. This puts them in a uniform superposition of all possible states in our computational bases. If this doesn't make sense, don't worry. Here's an example. Applying a Hadamard gate to each qubit in the zero state gives us an equal probability of measuring zero or one, which is an amplitude of one square root two each. With two qubits, if we have an equal probability of measuring zero or one in each of the two qubits, we have an equal probability of measuring the four permutations of two qubits. So one quarter probability equals one half amplitude, or 1 square root 2 times 1 square root 2, if we carry out the products of amplitudes of each individual qubit. Since we have an equal likelihood of measuring any of these possible outcomes with two qubits. This then generalizes to a system with n qubits. The curly braces of 0 and 1 to the power of n represents the possible permutation 
with replacement of zeros and ones that forms a string of length n. There are two to the power of n of these possible permutations, and each of these permutations represents one state in our computational basis for n qubits. This means our initial probability of measuring each of these permutations is 1 divided by 2 to the power of n. And consequently, the amplitude is 1 divided by square root to the power 2 to the power of n. When we sum each of these basis states together, represented by the sum of all ket x in the set of these permutations, we get our initial state ket phi. Now we know the actions of the Hadamards. Let's look at the two operators visually. Let's consider a system with four qubits, so 16 possible states. When we apply the Hadamard to each of these qubits, our current state vector transitions from the initial 0, 0, 0, 0 state to the uniform superposition state of phi. Now, what does our search operator do? We remember that we know the effect of the search operator is to flip the state we are searching for. Suppose that, just like the key example, we know in prior that 0, 0, 0, 1 is the right answer, and when we apply a search operator, that is a state that will be flipped. For simplicity, let's refer to this as the good states. Then, the bad states are everything else that we do not desire to be measured, and is everything else in this computational basis besides 0, 0, 0, 1. When we apply our search oracle, we simply flip the sign of the amplitude without affecting its value for the good state, or which is our reflection of the state. Applying this operator alone is not helpful, however. As we can see, negative amplitude still gives us the same probability as a positive amplitude. We need the next step to achieve our quantum speedup. So what happens with the reflection about the mean axes? Our diffusion operator. Using the intuition that we developed before, we know that in a reflection, one component, the component that is on the axis we are reflecting about, stays the same. Looking at the expression of the diffusion operator, we see that the projection of our current state vector onto the mean state, phi, will stay the same before and after this operation. We saw that the search operator decreased our mean amplitude slightly because now one amplitude is negative. This creates a difference between our current state vector and the mean amplitude vector, which this difference is labeled red. This is a component orthogonal to the mean amplitude vector because whatever is projected from the state onto the mean amplitude vector is already green. Therefore, everything else has to be orthogonal to this component. This component gets flipped since we are reflecting about the mean axes. Because the search operator made our good state's amplitude negative, the mean amplitude is slightly less than every other bad state with a positive amplitude. This means when we flip across the mean, our good state amplitude increases more since there's a greater difference between its negative amplitude and the mean, while every other bad state decreases slightly. If we repeat this process, we would continue to amplify our good states. But how many times? If we amplify too much, our mean amplitude will become negative. And this causes us to actually decrease the amplitude of our good state, and we amplify the bad states again, which is quite interesting. And so we have to figure out how many times we should run this Grover's operation before we stop to measure. The last piece of the puzzle is then to represent all the components together in one coherent picture. In a previous picture, we reflected the good state s, as well as our current state about the mean amplitude vector, phi. What if we created a subspace spanned by these two vectors, s and phi? Well, we can. But phi contains a small component in the direction of the good state s. So they are not exactly orthogonal vectors in this subspace. Precisely, this component has a magnitude of 1 over square root n. We can easily find an orthogonal vector that is in the subspace spanned by the good state and phi. Whatever component of phi that is not s has to be the orthogonal component, because any vector that lives in this subspace has to be a linear combination of the two orthogonal vectors, which is just as we see. 
the orthogonal state can be expressed as the sum of all the states in the computational basis minus the good state. We then more normalize it by 1 over square root n minus 1. Let's call this state s perp. We see that they differ by some angles. Let's call it theta for now. When we apply the search operator, we reflect the s state component of our current state. At this step, the difference is still 1 theta to s perp, but we are now 2 thetas away from the state phi, our initial state. So when we apply the diffusion operator and reflect about phi, we are still 2 thetas away from phi, but now we are 3 thetas away from s perp. And so we repeat this process again, and now amplifying our state to 5 thetas away from s perp. Knowing this, how many thetas will get us the closest to pi over 2, when the amplitude of s will be the greatest, that is, to maximize the success probability of our search being successful. Because if we do any more rotations, we might over-rotate, and there's a point when our success probability actually decreases with more operations. If every time we increase by 2 theta, the answer seems simple enough. We start with 1 theta, and then each iteration provides an additional 2 thetas. So then we solve 2t plus 1 times theta equals or approaches pi over 2. So finally, we can ask, what is theta? From the geometric picture, we can use our trick identity to divide the opposite and the hypotenuse. We know the hypotenuse has a length of 1 because its norm has to be 1 to represent probabilities as a state vector. Our opposite length in the initial state is 1 over square root n. So we use our trick identities and find arc sine opposite divided by hypotenuse, which is arc sine 1 over square root n, which when we assume n is big, the arc sine can be approximated by what's inside, which is 1 over square root n. Now we can see how many iterations we need to get as close as possible to pi over 2. Beginning with what we had before, we replace theta with 1 over square root n, and we can finally solve for t and find that t equals pi over 4 times square root n minus 1 half. Since the big O notation only concerns the scaling with n and not the coefficients, we can say that Grover's algorithm has a big O of square root n, as its upper bound of runtime needed is proportional to the square root of n, our input size. And you've made it. In this video, we talked about the unstructured search problem and why we usually cannot do better than guess and check. We then talked about what reflections are and generalize it as an operator for higher dimensions. Finally, we talked about the Grover's algorithm, how the initial state is created, and how the two operators are reflections that generate rotation to kit s, the state we want to be measured. Based on the angle of rotation, we derived the computational complexity geometrically and saw how many times we need to repeat these two steps to have a high probability of measuring the correct results, our ket s. That is, Grover's algorithm achieves a quadratic speedup over the classical search method for unstructured search problems, as we reduce the complexity from big O of n to a big O of square root n. The generalization of Grover's algorithm is now a family of promising algorithms. Therefore, I hope this intuitive understanding of this algorithm can help understand the family of generalized algorithm further down the road. Thank you for watching.